Welcome to the webinar, Ensuring a Safe Workplace, Employer Duties, and Addressing Sexual Harassment in Ontario, presented by the Barbara Schieffer Commemorative Clinics, hashtag and Me Too, Project Survivor Rights and Employer Duties in Precarious Workplaces. Sexual harassment is a pressing issue in, in workplaces all across Ontario, and it's vital for employers to understand their responsibilities in preventing and addressing it. Through this webinar, we'll delve into the legal framework, practical strategies, and resources available to employers to effectively tackle sexual harassment in the workplace. Disclaimer. It is important to note that the information provided in this webinar is legal information only and is not to be used for the purposes of individualized legal advice. Due to the constantly changing nature of the law, the Barbara Schieffer Commemorative Clinic cannot guarantee the accuracy of the information provided outside of when this webinar has first been made available to the public. About the clinic. The Barbara Schieffer Commemorative Clinic offers legal services and representation trauma-informed counseling and multilingual interpretation services to diverse women who have experienced violence. Our mandate is to cultivate women's skills and resilience by fostering their safety, dignity, and equality. As an organization led by and for women, and survivors of gender-based violence, we amplify women's voices to create individual and collective change. As we delve into the topic of addressing sexual harassment in the workplace, we understand that as employers, particularly in the hospitality and service sector, you face unique obstacles in navigating the complex landscape of sexual harassment prevention and response in the workplace. Including staff struggles and high turnover rates, the hospitality and service sector in Canada has currently seen a historic level of job vacancies owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. We also understand that industries like hospitality and service, where turnover rates can be high, maintaining consistent messaging and enforcement of policies can be an uphill battle. And that the revolving door of employees means frequent onboarding and training, making it challenging to ensure that everyone is on the same page regarding expectations around workplace behavior. Take for instance this example that illustrates why this webinar is crucial for you as an employer. Meet Carrie, the owner of a popular restaurant in Ontario, known for its diverse menu and welcoming atmosphere. Carrie has worked hard to build a team that provides excellent service and fosters a welcoming atmosphere. Carrie is committed to providing jobs and opportunities to newcomers to Canada, recognizing the challenges they may face in finding employment. One of Carrie's recent hires is Rosa, a Syrian immigrant who recently arrived in Canada with hopes of starting a new life. Reza is excited to work at Carrie's restaurant and quickly becomes a valued member of the team. However, as Reza settles into her role, she begins to experience unwelcome advances and inappropriate comments from one of her co-workers, Steve, a longtime employee in the kitchen. Despite her discomfort, Reza hesitates to speak up, fearing that she may lose her job or face retaliation from Steve and his friends in the workplace. Meanwhile, Carrie notices a change in Reza's behavior and decides to have a private conversation with her to inquire about her well-being. Reza reluctantly confides in Carrie revealing the harassment she's been enduring from Steve. Carrie is deeply troubled by Reza's revelation and realizes the urgency of addressing the situation promptly and effectively. 
Carrie knows that she has a legal obligation to address sexual harassment in the workplace. And as a small business owner, she is unsure, though, of how to make the appropriate steps and where to start, particularly given Reza's status as a newcomer to Canada. In this scenario, the webinar would provide Carrie with essential guidance in addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. By the end of the webinar, Addressing Sexual Harassment in the Workplace, Employer Duties, you will learn, one, legal framework. You will understand the legal obligations imposed on employers under the Ontario Human Rights Code and the Occupational Health and Safety Act regarding sexual harassment in the workplace. Two, understand the definition of sexual harassment. You will recognize various forms of sexual harassment and understand what behaviors constitute sexual harassment under the law. 4. Employer Responsibilities Comprehend the duties of employers to create and maintain a workplace environment free from harassment and discrimination, including sexual harassment. 4. Policies and procedures. You will learn how to develop effective policies and procedures for preventing and addressing sexual harassment. 5. Preventive measures. You will explore proactive strategies for creating a culture of respect and inclusivity in the workplace. 6. Responding to complaints. You will understand how employers should respond to complaints of and investigations into incidents of sexual harassment in the workplace. 7. Consequences of non-compliance. You will recognize the potential legal liabilities that employers may face for failing to fulfill their duties in addressing sexual harassment in the workplace under the Ontario Human Rights Code, and the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Legal Framework for Employer Obligations In Ontario, all employers have an obligation to provide its employees with a workplace environment that is free from sexual harassment. The Occupational Health and Safety Act, otherwise known as OSHA, prohibits workplace violence and harassment. The Ontario Human Rights Code of Ontario outlines a worker's right to be free from sexual harassment in the workplace. The Criminal Code of Canada places a duty on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent bodily harm to any person arising from work performed in a workplace. Under the Human Rights Code of Ontario, you do not need to be in a formal employee-employer relationship for these provisions to apply. Under this statute, the term employer is broad and includes the relationship between an independent contractor. It also includes any harassment you experience at a job interview, even if you do not end up getting the job. Under OSHA and the Human Rights Code of Ontario, once you make a report of workplace sexual harassment, there is a legal duty placed on your employer to investigate and respond to your report. If the employer fails to do that, then your rights under OSHA and the Ontario Human Rights Code have been breached. Today, we are going to take a closer look at the employer responsibilities under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, as well as the Ontario Human Rights Code. Before we take a closer look at OSHA, and the Ontario Human Rights Code and the legal responsibilities these two statutes provide. We will first look at what sexual harassment is and examples of what behaviors constitute sexual harassment in the workplace. Sexual harassment is defined as engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct which is known or ought reasonably to be known as unwelcome. This definition of sexual harassment is directly from the Human Rights Code of Ontario and is widely used as a legal framework when defining sexual harassment. In legal proceedings in Ontario, 
This definition of sexual harassment is itself used in the OSHA, used in OSHA, which we will take a closer look at later in the webinar. What does this definition of sexual harassment mean? Sexual harassment is when someone's comments or actions are sexual in nature without consent, undermining a person's dignity, and creates a hostile, intimidating, or offensive work environment. This can en encompass verbal, physical, or visual behaviors or comments, and it can occur between individuals of the same or different genders. The comments or actions can happen over a short or prolonged period of time. Sexual harassment can occur when a person in a, posi in a position of power makes a sexual request, advance, or comments or actions that are unwelcome. It is important to understand that sexual harassment is not only about unwelcome sexual actions or comments. Sexual harassment can be also about biological sex, gender expression, and sexual orientation. For instance, gender-based harassment is a form of sexual harassment that is used as a gender policing tool to enforce conformity with sex role stereotypes. Employers should understand any unwelcome conduct or comments of a sexual nature that is explicitly or implicitly a term or condition of employment or of a person's education or seat of services is used as a basis for decisions affecting employment or opportunities for training or promotion, creates a poison work environment interfering with an individual's ability to work or access, or access services is sexual harassment per the Human Rights Code of Ontario and must be investigated and addressed by employers. The Human Rights Code of Ontario. As mentioned, the definition of sexual harassment in the workplace comes from the Human Rights Code of Ontario. And this definition is widely used in legal frameworks in Ontario and by the Ministry of Labour of Ontario. But what is the Human Rights Code of Ontario? The Ontario Human Rights Code is a provincial law. It prohibits discrimination in the areas of housing, contracts, employment, goods, services, faculties, memberships in unions, trade or professional services. The Ontario Human Rights Code prohibits discrimination on the grounds of or based on age, ancestry, skin color, race, citizenship, ethnic origin, place of origin, creed, disability, family status, marital status, including single status, gender identity, gender expression, Receipt of public assistance in housing only, record of offenses in employment only, sex, including pregnancy and breastfeeding, and sexual orientation. All employees have a right to work in an environment that is free from sexual harassment. As such, employers have significant legal responsibilities under the Human Rights Code of Ontario to prevent and address sexual harassment in the workplace. These responsibilities include 1. Non-retaliation. Employers are prohibited from retaliating against employees who report incidents of sexual harassment or participate in investigations into incidents of sexual harassment in the workplace. Retaliation, also known as reprisal, against complainants is a violation of the code. The code explicitly states, every person has the right to be free from reprisal or a threat of reprisal for the rejection of a sexual solicitation or advance where the reprisal is made or threatened by a person in a position to confer, grant, or deny a benefit or advancement to the person.
policy development. Employers must develop comprehensive and policies and procedures that explicitly address sexual harassment in the workplace. These policies should define sexual harassment, provide examples of prohibited conduct specific to each individual workplace, and outline reporting and investigation procedures. If awareness and understanding is not present or inadequate in a workplace, resistance to intervention to sexual harassment will likely appear. 3. Prevention measures. Employers have a duty to take proactive steps to prevent sexual harassment from occurring. This includes providing regular training to employees and supervisors on recognizing, preventing, and addressing sexual harassment. Adult learning strategies, including the use of lectures, discussions, questions, and answers, supplemental handouts, participant booklets, and interactive slideshows that define what constitutes sexual harassment, describes behaviors to avoid, explains how to handle sexual harassment incidents, and notes how to report sexual harassment have been effective strategies in responding to sexual harassment in the workplace. Indeed, the use of a variety of interactive teaching methods that appeals to adult learners while discussing and analyzing specific job-related scenarios and antidotes are also recommended. In Four, investigation and response. Employers must promptly and thoroughly investigate any complaints of sexual harassment. Investigation should be conducted in a fair, impartial, and confidential manner and appropriate action should be taken based on the findings. It is important for employers to understand that workplace climate is notably affected by the behavior of organizational leaders and how proactive they are perceived to be in addressing issues in the workplace. As such, managers, supervisors, and assigned designates who are responsible for responding to reports of sexual harassment should receive ongoing specialized training on how to respond to and investigate workplace sexual harassment in a trauma-informed and procedurally fair manner. 5. Accommodation Employers have a duty to accommodate employees who have experienced sexual harassment to the point of undue hardship. A quick look at understanding undue hardship and sexual harassment in the workplace. 1. Definition of undue hardship. The Human Rights Code of Ontario does not define undue hardship explicitly, but it generally is understood as referring to the point at which accommodating an employee's needs would result in significant difficulty or expense for the employer. Factors considered in assessing undue hardship. Employers must consider various factors when determining whether accommodation would cause undue hardship. Factors may include a. Financial cost. Whether the accommodation would impose significant financial burden on the employer. b. Size and nature of the organization. The resources and structure of the organi organization as well as the nature of its operations are also taken into account. C. Health and safety requirements. Whether the accommodation would compromise health and safety standards. D. Impact on efficiency and productivity. Whether the accommodation would significantly disrupt workflow or impair productivity. E. Impact on other employees. Whether the accommodation would negatively impact other employees or the overall functioning of the workplace. Accommodating Sexual Harassment Survivors Assessment of Accommodation Requests When an employee 
requests accommodation due to sexual harassment, employers must assess the request in a timely manner. This involves gathering information about the employee's needs and considering possible accommodation measures. Accommodations may include changes to work arrangements, schedules, or duties, providing support services, including counseling or medical assistance, adjusting work arrangements, such as transferring the employee to a different department or location, or offering alternative employment options. Demonstrating undue hardship. Employers bear the burden of demonstrating that accommodating an employee's needs would cause undue hardship. Employers should document their efforts to accommodate and provide clear rationale for any decisions based on undue hardship. Good faith efforts. Employers are expected to make good faith efforts to fully accommodate employees within the limits of undue hardship. This involves exploring various accommodation options and engaging in meaningful dialogue with the employee throughout the process. Record keeping. Employers should maintain accurate records of sexual harassment complaints, investigations, and actions taken to address incidents. Keeping detailed records helps demonstrate compliance with legal requirements and may be necessary for legal proceedings. Legal consequences. Failure to accommodate an employee who has experienced sexual harassment to the point of undue hardship can result in legal consequences for the employer, including complaints to the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. Employers may be ordered to provide accommodation, pay damages, or take other corrective measures. Failure to comply. Employers in Ontario who fail to comply with the Ontario Human Rights Code regarding sexual harassment in the workplace may face some potential consequences of non-compliance. For instance, survivors of sexual harassment may file a complaint with the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario on the grounds of discrimination based on sex or other protected grounds under the Ontario Human Rights Code. The Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario adjudicates issues of discrimination and harassment applied under the Human Rights Code of Ontario. Financial penalty. If the tribunal determines that the employer has engaged in discriminatory practices, it may order remedies such as financial compensation and, may be, and the employer may be ordered to pay monetary damages to the survivors of sexual harassment as compensation for the harm suffered. The amount of damages awarded by the tribunal can vary depending on factors such as the severity of the harassment, the impact on the survivor, and the employer's response to the complaint. Remedial measures. In addition to financial penalties, employers may be required to take remedial measures to address systemic issues related to sexual harassment in the workplace. This could include implementing or revising anti-harassment policies and procedures, providing training for employees and management, and conducting regular audits to monitor compliance. Now that we have explored the employer's responsibilities outlined by the Human Rights Code, let's shift our focus to another crucial aspect of ensuring a safe and respectful workplace, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, otherwise known as OSHA. The Occupational Health and Safety Act. The Occupational Health and Safety Act, otherwise known as OSHA, is a fundamental piece of legislation that outlines the legal framework for ensuring the health and safety of workers in the province of Ontario. It applies to most workplaces, including businesses, factories, construction sites, hospitals, schools, and government offices. OSHA sets out the rights and responsibilities of employers, supervisors, workers, and others in the workplace to create a safe and healthy work environment. The primary purpose of OSHA is to prevent workplace injuries and illnesses by establishing minimum standards for health and safety in Ontario workplaces. OSHA applies to all workplaces covered by the province of Ontario, with some exemptions for federal workplaces, mines, and certain agricultural activities. Under OSHA, who is an employee? 
Under OSHA, worker is broadly defined. It includes, one, a person who performs work or supplies services for monetary compensation, two, a secondary school student who performs work or supplies services for no monetary compensation under a work experience program authorized by the school board that operates the school in which the student is enrolled, Three, a person who performs work or supplies services for no monetary compensation under a program approved by a college of applied arts and technology, university, private career college, or other post-secondary institution. Four, such other persons as may be prescribed who perform work or supply services to an employer for no monetary compensation. The Occupational Health and Safety Act does, does have exceptions to its broad definition of employees. Doctors, lawyers, directors of corporations, and federal employees are not included as employees under OSHA. Sexual harassment and OSHA. Employers have a legal responsibility under the Occupation Health and Safety Act to prevent and address workplace violence, which includes workplace sexual harassment. Workplace policies and sexual harassment. Employers who are subject to OSHA must prepare policies with respect to workplace violence and workplace sexual harassment and review them at least once a year. In a workplace where there are six or more regularly employed workers, the policies are required to be in writing and posted in the workplace where workers are likely to see them. These policies should explicitly state the prohibition of sexual harassment and outline the consequences for engaging in such behavior. These policies should define sexual harassment, provide examples of prohibited conduct, and explain explicitly the complaint process and how employees can report incidents of sexual harassment. The employer must consult with the Joint Health and Safety Committee, which should consist of five or more employees or the health and safety representative in developing and maintaining its anti-sexual harassment program. Incident reporting and investigation. Employers must have measures and procedures in place for workers to report incidents of workplace sexual harassment, including for the summoning of immediate assistance when workplace sexual harassment occurs or is likely to occur and how the employer will investigate and deal with incidents or complaints of workplace sexual harassment. Employees should feel comfortable reporting incidents without fear of retaliation. For sexual harassment policies to be effective, employees must not only be aware of those policies, but they must be seen to be proactive and viable options for constructive resolution that shields workers from retaliation. Employers who have a, le have a legal duty under OSHA to investigate promptly and thoroughly all reports of sexual harassment and violence in the workplace and take appropriate action based on the findings. OSHA requires that an investigation of workplace sexual harassment occurs. Employers must set out how they will make sure confidential information is not disclosed unless it is necessary to conduct an investigation, take corrective action, or disclose information as required by law. Employers must conduct an investigation that is appropriate to the circumstances. The investigation must be timely. The investigator may not be a person with direct control over the complainant. Results of the investigation, such as a summary of the findings and information on any corrective action, shall be provided in writing by the employer to the complainant and the respondent. Hazard Assessment A. Employers are required to conduct a hazard assessment to identify and evaluate potential sources of workplace violence including sexual harassment, specific to each individual workplace. This assessment involves identifying areas of the workplace where violence or harassment are more likely to occur, such as an isolated work area, late night shifts, or interactions with the public. The employer is required to take measures to control risks identified in the assessment that are likely to expose a worker to injury. B. The employer must advise the Joint Health and Safety Committee or Health and safety representative, if any, of the assessment results. If the assessment is in writing, the employer must provide a copy to the Joint Health and Safety Committee or the Health and Safety Representative. If there is no Joint Health and Safety Committee or the Health and Safety Representative, the employer must advise workers of the assessment themselves.
If the assessment is in writing, the employer must provide copies to the workers on request or advise the workers how to obtain co copies. C. Employers must repeat the assessment as often as necessary to ensure the workplace harassment and violence policy and related programs continue to prevent workers from workplace harassment and violence and inform the Joint Health and Safety Committee or the Health and Safety Representative or workers of the results of the reassessment. Preventive measures. Based on the hazard assessment, employers should implement preventive measures to reduce the risk of workplace sexual harassment and violence, which can include policies and procedures aimed at preventing harassment and violence. This may include implementing a zero-tolerance policy for harassment that holds all individuals to the same standard, provide training on recognizing and reporting harassment, and establishing clear procedures for investigating and addressing complaints. Employee training. OSHA recommends that employers provide training to employees on recognizing, preventing, and responding to workplace violence, including sexual harassment. Training should educate employees on what constitutes sexual harassment, how to recognize warning signs, how to safely intervene in situations, and how to report incidents to management or human resources. The risk of workplace sexual harassment increases when employees are unclear about how to identify sexual harassment and supervisors are unclear about how to respond to complaints. Employees and supervisors must be able to openly discuss and clarify what sexual harassment is as conceptualized by OSHA, what sexual harassment from the perspective of the survivor can look like what to do if employees are sexually harassed, and perceptions of their specific workplace policies. Protective measures. Employers have a duty to protect workers from workplace violence, including sexual harassment. This may include implementing physical security measures, such as installing security cameras or panic buttons, as well as providing support services for survivors, such as counseling or legal assistance. A best practice would be that workers are supported in developing a safety plan to ensure that sur survivor feels supported in staying safe from further sexual harassment at the workplace. This safety plan should be reevaluated on an ongoing basis to maintain the health, safety, and well being of the survivor of workplace sexual harassment. In high risk situations, it is essential that organizations have more than one person assess the situation or seek outside support. Record keeping Employers should maintain records of workplace violence incidents, including sexual harassment complaints investigations and actions taken to address incidents. Keeping accurate records can help demonstrate compliance with OSHA requirements. Evaluation and improvement. Employers should regularly evaluate the workplace violence prevention efforts, including measures to address sexual harassment and make improvements as necessary. This may involve reviewing policies and procedures, analyzing incident data, and soliciting feedback from employees. Unfortunately, once a workplace sexual harassment policy is in place, many organizations neglect to revisit and evaluate the impact of the policy on employees, or even whether employees are aware of the policy. Without evaluation, it will be unclear if the policy is successful in addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. This lack of ongoing evaluation is partially responsible for the prevalence of sexual harassment in the workplace, despite organizations having sexual harassment policies and procedures in place. How to foster a culture of respect and zero tolerance of sexual harassment in the workplace. Clear policies and procedures. Develop and implement comprehensive policies and procedures that explicitly address sexual harassment in the workplace per OSHA and the Human Rights Code of Ontario. 
clearly define what constitutes sexual harassment, provide examples of prohibited conduct, and outline the reporting and investigation procedures. Ensure that the policies are communicated to all employees and easily accessible, such as through employee handbooks or internet portals. Training and education. Provide regular training sessions for all employees on recognizing, preventing, and responding to sexual harassment. Train managers and supervisors on their roles and responsibilities in addressing sexual harassment complaints and creating a respectful workplace culture. Include interactive components in training sessions, such as case studies and scenarios, to ensure active participation and understanding. Promote open communication. Ensure open communication and dialogue among employees about workplace harassment, including sexual harassment. Create channels for employees to report incidents of harassment confidentially and without fear of reprisal. Foster a culture where employees feel comfortable speaking up if they witness or experience harassment and ensure that their concerns are taken seriously and addressed promptly. Lead by example. Senior leadership and management should demonstrate a commitment to promoting a respectful workplace culture by modeling appropriate behavior and communication. Hold leaders and managers accountable for upholding the organization's policies on sexual harassment and treating all employees with dignity and respect. Address power imbalances. Be mindful of power imbalances within the workplace as they can contribute to situations of sexual harassment in the workplace. Provide avenues for employees to raise concerns about abuse of power and inappropriate behavior by those in positions of authority. Support survivors and provide resources. Offer support services and resources to employees who have experienced sexual harassment, such as counseling, legal assistance, or referrals to both external and internal support organizations. Ensure that survivors of harassment are provided with accommodations and support to address any physical or emotional impacts of the harassment. Regular review and improvement. Continuously review and update policies and procedures related to sexual harassment prevention to ensure that they remain effective and relevant. Solicit feedback from employees on their experiences with the organization's anti-harassment efforts and make adjustments as necessary. Monitor trends and patterns related to harassment incidents and take proactive measures to address any emerging issues. By implementing these strategies, employers can create a culture of respect and inclusivity in the workplace that promotes the prevention of sexual harassment and ensures the well-being of all employees in accordance with OSHA and the Human Rights Code of Ontario. In the review, thank you all for joining us today as we discuss the critical topic of employer responsibilities in addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. We began by delving into what sexual harassment is, as well as the provisions the Ontario Human Rights Code has, which mandate employers to create a workplace free from discrimination and harassment, including sexual harassment. We emphasize the importance of understanding the legal definition of sexual harassment and the obligations placed on employers to prevent, address, and, and as a result, accommodate as a result of instances of harassment. Transitioning to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, we discussed the duty of employers to develop and implement comprehensive policies and procedures to prevent workplace sexual harassment, to ensure that employers receive adequate training on recognizing, preventing, and responding to sexual harassment, and the employer's duty to promptly investigate and address any reports or complaints of sexual harassment in the workplace. Through our discussion, we emphasized the following key points. The significance of having clear policies, comprehensive training, and effective reporting and investigation procedures in place. The need for proactive measures to create a culture of respect and inclusion in the workplace. The importance of leadership commitment and accountability in promoting a safe and respectful workplace. As we conclude today's webinar, I urge all employers to take proactive steps to ensure compliance with both the Human Rights Code of Ontario and the Occupational Health and Safety Act. By prioritizing the prevention of sexual harassment, fostering a culture of respect, and supporting survivors, we can create workplaces where all employees feel valued, respected, and safe. 
Please let us know how you found this webinar by completing a short online survey found below. Once again, thank you for watching. If you have any further questions or need additional resources, please do not hesitate to contact the Barbara Schaefer Commemorative Clinic at 416-323-9149 or email us at outreach at Let's continue working together to create workplaces where everyone can thrive.